Hello and welcome to another episode of the Veg Supercars Fancast. My name is Kendall. I will be your host. Right at the top, let me say that if my voice sounds strange, it's because I was sick over the weekend. Nothing serious, just a cold has affected my throat a little bit. But that won't stop me from talking about the Bathurst 1000, which took place over the weekend. And what a race it was. Um, compared to previous Bathursts, uh, quite straightforward, to be honest. Not boring by any means, but definitely a lot more um, plain and simple compared to some of the action-packed races we've had in the past. But nevertheless, we had a thrilling result A fantastic conclusion, a fairy tale finish for one of the sport's most beloved drivers of all time. A record-breaking amount of wins. Heartbreak for a certain driver. And plenty more to talk about. So right at the top, we had Jamie Winkup, David Reynolds, Scott McLaughlin, and Shane Van Gisbergen all put in fastest times with about two, not two seconds, about ten seconds to go before the end of qualifying. Those times were a 2 minute 4.1, a 2 minute 4.2, a 2 minute 4.28, and a 2 minute 4.3. Very close qualifying session. It was a lot of fun to watch. Of course, it was 40 minutes. That's twice the time of a regular qualifying session. So you might be wondering, who made it into the top 10 shootout? Well, so let me start from the start then. Jamie Winkup in first, David Reynolds, Scott McLaughlin, Shane Van Gisbergen with a 2 minute 4.38, followed by by James Courtney with a 2 minute 4.47, Craig Lowndes with a 2 minute 4.5, Cameron Waters, good to see Tickford up there with a 2 minute 4.579, that was 9 1,000 slower than Lowndes, Percat in eighth with a 2 minute 4.63, Anton Di Pasquale, good on him. He was fast this weekend with a 2 minute 4.69. And Garth Tanner in 10th spot with a 2 minute 4.85. A thrilling qualifying session if I do say so myself. Alright, so now that we've had the top 10, let's discuss the rest of the pack. In 11th, we had Chaz Mostert followed by James Golding. Another excellent weekend from a rookie. Andre Heimgardner in 13th, the best of the Nissans, followed by Rick Kelly. Fabian Coulthard, much, much further down the field than his teammate, followed by Michael Caruso. Richie Stanaway, Scott Pye, who was in 18th. And if you saw my race predictions video for the Bathurst 1000, I predicted that Scott Pye was one to watch. And I feel like in qualifying, I wasn't quite... Vindicated. Apparently, he had some brake problems, which was why he was so slow, especially compared to his teammate. But in the race, I was definitely proven right. And you'll have to wait till I get to the race results to find out what I mean. But in 19th, we have Mark Winterbottom, followed by Tim Slade, who also supposedly had problems, hence why he's so far down compared to Percat. Lee Holdsworth, who had a terrible weekend, and that really just sums up his season so far. Tim Blanchard in 22nd, Todd Hazelwood in 23rd, Will Davison in 24th, Jack LeBrock in 25th after he had an accident off of Turn 1 in qualifying, and Simona De Silvestro in 26th. Not sure why she was so slow. Um, She was three tenths off Jack LeBrock's time. Uh, In total, she was 2.3 seconds off Jamie Winkup's time. So well off the pace. Um, And she picked up during the race, so I'm not quite sure why she was so slow. But now we need to move into the top 10 shootout. So for those who don't know, the Bathurst 1000 is a race with a qualifying session, the top 10 of which move into a phase called the top 10 shootout, where the 10 best drivers from qualifying do a one-shot lap to see who is the fastest in one go. No preparation. They do a warm-up lap, and that's it. Then they go. You get it right, you get it wrong. It really determines who is the best around this mountain. And the results are as follows. And I'm going to take it in reverse order this time. Just to hold the suspense for longer. You're welcome. In 10th place, Garth Tander with a 205.1717. 
In ninth, we had Craig Lowndes, also with a 205, but a 205 flat, 205.0835. James Courtney in eighth with a 205.0033. Nick Perka in seventh with a 204.7673. Cameron Waters in sixth with a 204.7517. Scott McLaughlin in fifth with a 204.5494. Shane Van Gisbergen in fourth, not moving from his qualifying position with a 204.5385. Very close to McLaughlin's time. Anton Di Pasquale, the second person to go out on the shootout because they go out in reverse of where they qualified. Put in an incredible time. An incredible time that took until the last two drivers to knock down. He put in a 204.3498, which is incredibly fast. Great job from him in his first full-time season in V8 Supercars. He must have been incredibly proud with that, and he should be. That was an excellent effort. Jamie Winkup in second with a 204.0682. And keep that number in mind because David Reynolds came first with a 204.0588. Jamie Winkup only nine thousandths of a second slower than David Reynolds. Another thrilling session around the mountain. If you didn't see the top 10 shootout, I highly recommend you watch them. I watch them every year. This one was no exception. It was incredibly close. It was amazing trying to see them knock over Anton Di Pasquale's lap, which until Jamie Winkup wasn't achieved. And um, Sorry, Reynolds was the first person to put in a faster time than Pasquale. And he only was the second last driver to go out. So until then, Anton was in first the whole time and by a significant margin too. Shane Van Gisbergen almost two tenths down on his time. So excellent job from him. But that puts us into a thrilling race with David Reynolds and Jamie Winkup showing significant pace along with David Reynolds' teammate Anton Shane and Scott are starting next to each other, remembering that they are first and second in the championship right now. Cameron Waters in sixth with a ton to prove after nearly winning last year's race. Nick Perkat, a former winner a long time ago with Garth Tander, looking to reclaim that glory. James Courtney looking for, I think, his first time win. Craig Lowndes looking for seven wins, and this one would be his Last win before retiring from full-time supercars. What an ending that would be. And Garth Tander in 10th. One of the one of the people on the field, along with Craig Lowndes and Jamie Winkup, who has proven to be a master of the mountain, a multi-time winner. What an exciting 10 spots we have for the race. And without further ado then... Let's head right into the race. And before I talk about the race results, there are a few moments that I wish to discuss in further detail. So if you are new to my podcast, I usually go over the uh, results of the race and then discuss what happened to each individual driver as I come across them. But for the sake of suspense, I am going to go over the moments of the race Before I talk about the results, and there were a couple of moments. One of the most significant ones was Mostert's collision with his teammate's Monster Energy car that is normally driven by Cameron Waters. At the time, it was driven by his co-driver, Daryl Russell. Hold on, I need to check. Um, Let's just... David Russell. David, much more sensible name. Um, Sorry if your name's Darren. Um, still love you. But if you didn't see, what happened was that Chaz Mostert um, went for an overtake on his teammate's car at Forest Elbow, um, a spot that he is particularly good at overtaking at. He went for a dive down the inside on a car that come out on cold tires and only come out of the pits a couple of laps ago. Mostert was quite clearly faster. Uh, he makes a move and... Then he hits the left rear panel, um, or it's more like the side of his car, um, just in front of the left rear wheel. 
which causes um, David to oversteer in towards the middle of the corner. He then overcorrects and hits the outside wall, breaking his right front, I think, suspension. I don't quite remember exactly what broke, but he couldn't drive. He then weirdly made the decision of going flat out down Conrod and then uh, nearly just binned it into a wall and got stuck in the sand trap at the chase, which was a bit strange. Uh, he probably could have felt that his wheel wasn't on properly anymore, so I'm not sure why he did that. Uh, but he managed to limp back into the pits. They garaged the car. They did manage to get it back out 13 laps down, and he ended up finishing in 23rd. So good on him for the recovery. Um, they were saying all race that he actually had the fastest car around the circuit multiple times. So unfortunate that he was taken out because we could have seen a, an excellent result from him had he stayed in the race. But the more important question, who was at fault? Well, if you can watch some footage of the incident, I recommend that you do, especially Chaz Mostert's onboard camera, because I believe it tells the correct story. Uh, it's hard to see from the exterior cameras uh, what exactly happened, but from the onboard from Chaz Mostert, it seems pretty clear to me that uh, Chaz went for a gap and David just did not give him enough room. Uh, Mostert had the move pretty much made, and then he understeers into him in the middle of the corner. Um, yes, Mostert probably took a bit of more of a risk than he should have, but David could have left much more space than he did, considering it's a teammate. This is something that you need to look out for. And Mostert and Chris Piffer... I believe it was, or it was uh, Muscat. It depends on which car it was. I don't remember off the top of my head. But Mostert, on, on his way through the field, made a very similar move down the inside at Forest Elbow on one of the Gary Roger Motorsport cars, and they demonstrate how to do it. Gave him plenty of room, and he made it the pass nice and clean that time. To me, the fact that David could have given him more room the fact that he was a teammate and the fact that not only about f less than five laps later, the move was done much more cleanly with someone who gave him more room to do the move indicates to me that it is simply a racing incident. Neither party wanted to yield and so they collided. Unfortunate that it was a teammate, but I think the officials made the right decision um, in the end. But that's not how Waters saw it. And I uh, got some quotes here from his comments he made during the race, um, both to the camera and also by captured by an ambient microphone while he was talking to Russell. Uh, this is from supercars.com. D. Russ just got out there, referring to David Russell. Um, I don't know what Chaz was doing trying to pass him and put him in the fence. Pretty dumb. 30 laps into the race, two years in a row, got taken out by Chaz. He was furious. And of course, if you remember last year, Chaz Mostert made a very similar, let's say, mistake, a bold move trying to pass Waters last year. So it's understandable why he was so angry. It really is. Um, it's a real shame too, because I believe Waters had more car speed than Mostert did. And Mostert finished in a very high place. I won't spoil it yet. Um, and captured by a ambient microphone, so a microphone sitting in pit lane, unaware to Waters, probably. Um, Waters said to Russell, Sorry man, we just got fucked up by our fucking teammate. Sorry for the language. But that's a direct quote from Waters to Russell when he came back to the pits. That sucks. It really does. Um, in Mostert's defense, he responded with, D. Russ just came out of the pits on a new set of tires. It looked like there was a big gap there, and it does look like that on the onboards. So I went down the inside and stopped it, but just ran out of room in the middle of the corner. He's referring to here to understeering wide, just a little bit into D uh, David Russell. It definitely wasn't my intention to do something bold, but the car was stopped, and it's a pretty tight corner as it is. It's a real shame for the monster guys. If I could take it all back, I would wait for another opportunity. You never want to make contact with your teammates. And that really just sums it up. 
for me. You never want to make contact with your teammates. Never do that if you can avoid it. And he's right. He should have waited for another opportunity to do so. He probably would have gotten him down the chase of the speed he was carrying anyway. But I really, really do think that Russell could have given him more room. I even think he might have turned into him a little bit coming around the chase. Um, had Waters been in that car, I don't think this incident would have happened. Russell is a co-driver and as such is not used to racing wheel-to-wheel -wheel with the supercars. He might have just misjudged how much room he had on the left side of his car, remembering that that's not the driver's side. For those who are international listeners... But overall, a real shame. Wish it hadn't happened. But we've still got more to talk about than that because Wing Cup, one of the favorites to win the race. And if you watched my prediction video, I predicted that he would win the race. And I was looking pretty accurate for a while until he lost his wheel. Yes, his right front tire fell off. Just didn't want to be in it anymore. Uh, Paul Dumbrell, his co-driver, was driving the car down pitch straight, and his front tire simply let go. Rolled away into the distance. Um, real shame for them, because they were having a good race. They were in fourth at the time, I believe. And the reason why it came off is because, um, you probably would know this if you watched the race yourself, because they went over at nauseum for a bit, but I'll reiterate again, very quickly, that the reason why it came off is because the safety clip that prevents it from coming off was apparently broken. How it was broken, no one seems to know. So that's worrying, but no one was hurt. The wheel was stopped. Um, the tire barrier at the end of Hell Corner did its job and stopped the wheel. And Dumbrell actually, amazingly, managed to make it all the way around the track on three wheels and get new wheels fixed on the car and keep going. Unfortunately, because the car had been dragged around uh, with one side scraping along the ground, the roll bar was damaged and the front tires were losing grip incredibly fast. So they had to make another pit stop, change the tires. This was during safety car, actually. It was very clever. They changed the tires, came back on the lead lap because they were a lap down at this point, zoomed all the way around the field to try and catch back up as fast as possible, went back into the pits under safety car still, fixed the roll bar, and went back out again to try and catch up with the safety car. And this way they managed to fix all their issues and also get back onto the lead lap. I was extremely impressed with that strategy call. That was excellent from them. Very clever. Uh, but unfortunately, it did mean that Wing Cup did not finish in a contentious position. Once again, I will go over the race results so as not to spoil it until then. But he did not win the race. Suffice it to say. Um, unfortunately for Triple Eight fans, they were also given a team penalty of a fine of five thousand dollars and a thirty team championship point docking for the loose wheel, which seems a bit ridiculous. It ruined their race, but a wheel flying down a straight loose at two hundred kilometers an hour is incredibly dangerous, and I think it is fair if these sorts of things are are punished. It won't affect the championship. It'll only affect constructors, so I think this is the best way to punish a team that makes this mistake. Not by taking your driver out of the championship fight or anything like that, but by simply finding the team and giving them some championship points deductions, which I think is acceptable. You can't have wheels rolling down. I mean, you can't have a wheel rolling around at 200 kilometers an hour. Someone will die. That's how people die. Uh, they get hit by flying bits of uh, cars, and that's how things get ugly. So, a bit unnecessary, maybe, but um, it is important to stop this sort of thing from happening. It can't just be left unnoticed. One more thing to talk about before I get into the really big stuff was... Alexander Prema. Now, if you watch the race, you might be wondering where I'm going with this because he did drive pretty well. Very well, in fact. But there was one incident in particular that I took incredible issue with. Um, I was not impressed at all. And that was when he went off at the chase. So if you didn't see it um, during the co-driver stint, I'm not quite sure what lap it was, but it was towards the end of the co-driver stint um, 
around probably 60, 70, 80 laps into the race. Um, Alex goes for a move up the inside of either Chris Piffer or uh, Muscat. Again, <laughs> they were both up there at the same at the same uh, position, so I'm not entirely sure which one he was going for. Um, but he did go for a move up the inside at the chase. He locks the brakes, goes too far, goes um, straight across the grass around that uh, small right-hander that's immediately after the chase and rejoins the circuit and immediately defends his line from the cars that he just corner-cutted to get in front of, nearly causing a major incident as they all have to rapidly avoid him. Um, Will Brown loses a few spots due to um, this car appearing in the middle of the track. Um, Macaulay Jones as well loses a few spots because he's pushed wide through uh, Murray's corner. Again, due to Alexander Prema's car just immediately appearing in front of them because there was four or five cars all in a line here and they're all trying to overtake each other. And as soon as and Prema brings the number 17 car directly into the middle of the racing line to defend his position after going off the circuit. If anyone remembers, I think it was 2014 or 15, uh, or 16 even, when, um, oh, I think it's Scott McLaughlin went off the track in the same, in the similar area. I think it was Scott McLaughlin. He was definitely involved. Um, goes off in a similar area at the chase. Rejoins the circuit after skipping that that right-hander and immediately jumps back onto the line as Garth Tander is attempting to make a move on Jamie Winkup. He hits Garth Tander, takes them both out of the race, and Jamie Winkup continues. Actually, I believe it might have been Jamie Winkup that went wide um, and hit Garth Tander. Oh, no, no, I don't remember anymore. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> I really should, but I don't remember anymore. Um, This sort of thing has happened before at this particular area of the circuit because it's easy to lock the brakes and go off and then your first instinct is to just keep going, which is fair enough. that That's the right thing to do. You should rejoin the track at a shallow angle. You don't want to join it perpendicular and then immediately hit someone. That'd be ridiculous. So he did the right thing there. But the thing that ruins it for me, and it's not... You could argue maybe, maybe it's an accident. Maybe he wasn't aware how close they were. Maybe he thought that he had time to jump in front of them without causing any serious problems. But the thing that ruins it for me is that he doesn't even attempt to redress his mistake. Now, if you're not sure, a redressing is what happens when you go off the track, corner cutting and take a position. You're meant to give that position back because you took that position unfairly. In this instance, uh... Prema did unfairly take a position. He was attempting a move. He missed. He failed to make the turn. He went straight off and then he came back on and immediately tried to defend the move that he made and not give back the position at all. Now, of course, giving back the position would probably mean losing the spot to a bunch of other cars. But that doesn't matter. That's not what the redressing is for. The redressing is to make sure that you give back the spot that you lost unfairly. And honestly, if you make a mistake making a pass and you go off the track then you made a mistake. That's your fault. You're lucky you didn't beach the car in the chase and you can continue racing at all, let alone giving away two or three positions due to your redress. But instead of doing any of that, instead of even trying to redress, he comes back onto the track and you can hear it on his onboard camera too, which is worth a listen if you haven't heard it. He immediately floors it as soon as he hits the uh, tarmac. The road, probably not tarmac, it's not the best word, but the road, as soon as he hits the road, he immediately floors the throttle, you can hear it, and he jumps from the far right-hand side of the road to the far left in order to protect the inside line at Murray's corner. This causes absolute chaos for the two immediate cars behind him, which I believe were the Gary Rogers car and Will Brown, who have to take immediate action to avoid just running into the guy. Then this causes a three-car turn into Murray's corner, of which Macaulay Jones comes out second best. Will Brown nearly has a major incident coming into that corner. He wiggles around an awful lot under braking, which was honestly quite scary. Going off there as a very short runoff, and the wall's right there. It could have been extremely messy. And yeah, there was no accident. Uh, everyone did get through. It ruined a few guys' race, um, races. 
Macaulay Jones was doing really well until then. And so was Will Brown. He was on a charge up the field. I was really impressed with Will Brown, actually. I think he's got a very bright future ahead of him, um, that young man. Um, but I was super, super unhappy with the way that he handled that redress. He didn't even bother trying to give back that position at all. He knew what he was doing was dangerous, but he just tried to protect his racing position. And supposedly, if you listen to the commentary, um, Scaife says that all the drivers had a um, race meeting before the race, and they discussed that you cannot go off after Conrad, after the chase, cut that right-hander and not redress because of the incident that happened a few years ago. You can't do that. You will be punished for it. Prema is not punished for it. Instead, he is given a bad sportsmanship flag, which basically means don't do it again or maybe we'll punish you. That's not good enough. It's not. What he did was extremely unsafe. He could have very easily caused a multi-car pileup with the actions that he took just to keep a position after his own mistake. That's not fair to the other drivers who didn't make a mistake. That's not fair to the Gary Rogers car, and I'm awfully sorry, I can't remember exactly who it was, but that's not fair to them who avoided his mistake, who gave him enough room to make the pass, and he failed to make the pass. He should get given that space back, no questions asked. He should not have to avoid a car that's making dramatic moves across the track to try and protect its position. Yes, it's racing. Yes, it's meant to be hard, but it's also Bathurst. It's not like there was two laps to go. He could have easily given those positions away, and McLaughlin or himself could have fought his way back. He clearly had a stronger car than most of the other guys in, in that particular racing pack. There was no reason why he could not have redressed the mistake sensibly and then fought back sensibly. And I do not think the response from the supercars officials was appropriate. I think they were very, very lenient because, because, and this is going to sound a bit tinfoil hatty, it's going to sound a bit conspiratorial, uh, but because that's the number 17 car. If that car finishes too far down the field and Shane wins the race, the championship fight loses a lot of steam. I think if that was anyone else, they would have received an immediate and much more harsher penalty. Maybe not a drive through maybe like 30 seconds to race time or 15 seconds to race time, more like. But I think if it was another car, it would have received a different penalty. But obviously that's me talking conspiracies. Who knows? We can't actually know because no one else did it. But that's fine. I think a, spa a bad sportsmanship flag was way too little. Way too little. It should have... Anything would have been better. A five-second penalty. Anything. Anything would have been better. I don't think it deserved a huge penalty because there was no accident, like I said. But it was so close to causing one. And a big one, too. At a corner where you do not want a big accident. There is not much runoff there. The wall is right next to you. It could have been extremely ugly. He nearly got rear-ended. Like... So many things could have gone wrong if one of those drivers had not made the correct decision in avoiding that car. And it was Prema's fault. It was just Prema's fault. There's no question about that. He, no one else made any mistakes there except for Prema. And instead of accepting that he made a mistake, he had tried to defend it. That is not on in racing, at least as far as I am concerned. So that was a little bit disappointing to see. But McLaughlin himself drove really well this weekend. Props off to him. He is one of the best around the mountain in this modern grid. I was just very disappointed with Prema's actions in that particular moment. But he did race very well aside from that. So I don't want to take any away, anything away from the man. I'm sure he's a good racer. Um, just that one particular moment. And I know tensions are high and all that stuff. But in that one particular moment, I think that just wasn't on. And mostly... Drivers can do whatever they want. Uh, it's up to the officials to enforce the rules, and I don't think that was done appropriately. So, that's just me. Um, officials always get things wrong, according to us, though. So, they can never do anything right, can they? Um, but, let's move on to... The defining moment of the race. Now, you probably all know what I am going to talk about now, but it is definitely worth talking about for more reasons than one. David Reynolds, 
he was going to win the race until with about 20 laps to go, his physical condition completely deteriorated into nothing. So what happened, for those of you that didn't see or didn't hear exactly what happened, um, Leons was gaining on Reynolds. Reynolds had quite the lead, actually, a couple of, uh, couple of seconds. Leons was slowly gaining on him. And in a couple of laps, he had overtaken him at Griffin's Bend fairly easily. And Reynolds radios in and says that the reason why he's been slowing down is because his leg is cramped and he can't brake properly. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a cramp while driving. It's a bit scary. Um, Even if you can't drive, I'm sure you can imagine what it's like to need both of your feet or even one of your feet, uh, to drive around safely, and suddenly one of your feet stops working. That's not a good feeling, and imagine doing that at 300 kilometers an hour for what is essentially around about 120 kilometers. That's a scary thought, and this is what happened to David Reynolds towards the end of this race. Now, he tried to tough it out. He really did, and... You've got to feel bad for the man. You really do. Um, He did his best. He really did do his best. But what ended up happening, they brought Luke Yildon on standby, his co-driver, to switch him, which is fair enough. That's what you would do if it was any other race or was any other point in the race. You would switch the driver, have Yildon continue. He's not as fast as Reynolds. No, but he could have easily finished the race. He is a good driver. He has proven that. Instead, uh, supposedly at the uh, request of his girlfriend, they decided to give him an electrolyte-filled drink to try and remove the cramping and get him back out there to finish the race with about 15 laps to go. So he makes his final pit stop to get to the end, puts on new tyres, no driver change, gives him a drink for his helmet, away he goes, except... Except his foot cramps on the clutch, which if you don't know, you need to hold the clutch down the whole time to stop the wheels from moving because this disengages the gearbox from the wheels and they can't turn. His foot cramps, uh, evidently he must have let go of the clutch because the rear wheel starts spinning while he's on air jacks. And if you don't know how it works in supercars, that is illegal. You can't do that. You immediately get a drive-through penalty for it. And he did. He did get a drive through penalty for it. And he had to come back through the pits again. Serve his penalty. And off he goes again. This time, Free's gone from second to about fifth now. And he immediately apologizes, apologizes over the radio, saying he's sorry, his foot cramped on the clutch, there was nothing he could do about it. That sort of thing. Again, you've got to feel really bad for the guy, but he made the wrong decision. He really did. He should have allowed the driver to be swapped he should have allowed Yulden to take over but he wouldn't do it and the reason why he wouldn't do it is because the man as it turns out and this is the reason why he was getting cramps he was sleep deprived he couldn't sleep properly all week apparently he was tired before the race and he was doing a triple stint at the end which is the equivalent to three normal races of supercars in a row with no brakes And he couldn't do it. He could not do it in the end. He was fast. He was really fast. He was doing really well, but he could not do it in the end. And that's not his fault. It really isn't. We know he's got the stamina to do this. He's done it before. He did it last year. He he was the defending champion coming into Bathurst, defending champion of the mountain. So we know he can do it. He doesn't have that to prove. What I'm disappointed in is twofold Reynolds clearly couldn't be trusted to make the right decision in hindsight so in hindsight um, his race engineer or even his team boss should have made the call themselves to swap him with Luke they should have done that but again that is in hindsight at the time Reynolds was swearing up and down that he was right to continue, and and this is the part that gets it for me, his girlfriend, I believe it's his girlfriend, 
uh, might be his wife, who knows, his partner, there we go, his partner also gave advice to the team that he would be okay if he had some electrolytes, which when I heard that over the television, I assumed that this was something that happens to Reynolds when he's tired, he gets cramps, and they always fix it by giving him a power rate or something, you know? Um, sounds fine to me, especially considering that his girlfriend, sorry, his partner was the one giving this advice. Your partner knows you pretty well, you know, unless they've been dating for like two months. Um, she should know what's best for him. She should know, she should know when he's capable of driving and when he's not capable of driving. Um, so I put my faith in them. I thought that they would be okay if he had some electrolytes. I thought maybe he'd uncramp a little bit. Unfortunately, before the electrolytes had time to get into his system properly, his foot cramps again, he gets a drive through. Sorry. His foot cramps again, he gets a drive through penalty. Now, there's a lot of people online I saw after the race criticizing these supercars officials for not forcing him to change, and I don't think I agree with that. I can't really imagine what would happen if supercars officials told Reynolds or Erebus that they had to swap their drivers, but I can't imagine the reaction would be good. I just cannot. Um, there's no precedent for like this in supercars as far as I know. I don't think anyone has been forced out of a car before from being tired. Usually they volunteer because they can't make it. Um, but even then, that's very rare as well. Um... I'm not sure if there is a rule for it in supercars. There must be some kind of safety rule. But then again, how do you tell a guy who's saying, no, I'm fine, that he's not fine? You can't just tell someone that they aren't okay. And if you do, he's probably more likely to, you know, not do it, to resent you for it at the very least. Um, it's a very tricky situation. I'm not entirely sure what should have been done at the time. Uh, obviously, in hindsight, he should have been pulled out, and I think his team is responsible for that. The team manager should be the one who makes that call, not Reynolds. Not Reynolds. If his foot is cramping, he should be out of that car, and I think that's what happened from now on. Even if it's not Reynolds, if it's any other driver and they say, my foot's cramping, I think they're going to be like, right, you're in the pits. We're changing you over with your co-driver. You're not fit to drive anymore. This might even be a rule now. Supercars might devise a rule to prevent this from happening because I was legitimately worried for him, especially after his drive through penalty, that he was going to get into a huge crash and, you know, he would just get hurt, which I don't want to see. I mean, you know, nobody wants to see that. That's that's sad, you know. Like, uh, Reynolds, is, Reynolds is a big part of the sport. He's a wonderful guy. He really livens up the, pa the the paddock with his antics and his comments. He's one of the funniest guys on the field at the moment. I don't want to see the guy get hurt. Um, but in the end, he made the decision himself after his drive through penalty to come in and change drivers anyway. So they ended up making two extra pit stops, essentially, including the drive through because of his error of judgment. And that's not, again, that's not entirely his fault. But you've got to make these decisions when you're a driver. He was sleep deprived. This is his job, you know. Um, the race waits for no one. Um, and it sucks that he didn't get enough sleep, but that's life, unfortunately. And so, yeah, he ended up losing the race because of that. Um, and that's not the worst thing in the world, really. He's won before. You'll definitely have the opportunity to win again. He's clearly very good at Bathurst. A very strong driver there. Um, he didn't have the strongest car, I don't think. Um, and he did very well. So, props on him. He should be really proud of what he did. But, they did an interview with him after the race. Um, or even, just, yeah, just an interview. Images of him after he got out of the car. And gosh, it was depressing. Um, if you're a Reynolds fan, I feel so bad for you. You must have been so upset. Um... As for me, I just like a good race, to be honest. But, yeah, it, it was a very sad moment to see him. He even gave a Greg Murphy a hug. Um, and it was great to see the camaraderie. That's one of the things I really like about this sport is the camaraderie between the drivers, the crew, everybody. Um, it's a bit more tightly knit than other sports, especially international sports. 
Um, but gosh, it was sad. I felt so bad for the guy. You've got to feel for him. You really do. Um, he had an excellent shot and he threw it away basically himself. And he's got to feel bad about that. Hopefully that doesn't weigh on him next year. Um, I hope he doesn't get sleep anxiety now because that would be awful if we lost a driver because they just can't sleep. That would, that would be so bad. Um, so hopefully that doesn't happen to him. I hope he doesn't dwell on it too much because it can happen to anybody. We all have bad nights. We all perform worse at work because of it. And this is his job. He goes out to race. And like the rest of us, you can't have a slack day at work with relatively no consequence just because you're sleepy. He's got to drive a car around at top speed the whole time and he's sleepy. So that's what happens when you don't get enough sleep. So that's unfortunate, but... We're not going to end on a bad note because the person who took him over for the lead, as you might remember, was Craig Lowndes, a six-time winner of the Bathurst 1000, debuted in 1996 as a full-time driver in the Supercars series. 2018, 22 years later, is his last year as a full-time driver in the series. And he takes the lead for the Bathurst 1000 way ahead of second place, which was Scott Pye. Hate to spoil it for you, but I was vindicated in my prediction video that Scott Pye would do well. He came in second again. Um, Way up the road, almost 10 seconds up the road from Pye. And Craig Lowndes stayed there until the end of the race, taking his seventh victory at the mountain in his last full-time year of supercars driving what an ending he started ninth on the grid i didn't think he had a strong enough car to do it he hadn't been driving that great all weekend and he pulls it out at the end of the race amazing is all i can say it was great seeing Lowndes win it was something i was secretly hoping for i didn't think he would but it was something i was secretly hoping for just like how I'm secretly hoping he'll win the championship somehow. I don't think that'll happen either, but it's possible. And as long as it's possible, I will hope. But this one thing happening, if he doesn't win the championship, this makes up for it big time. Almost as emotional as when he won uh, 2006 Bathurst when his uh, mentor, Peter Brock, died. And the Peter Brock, he won the, the, get my words out, he won the first Peter Brock trophy at the mountain. What a win. What an absolute win. This will go down in history as a great Bathurst victory for anybody. And now, if you're keeping track, he is tied with Jim Richards for the most amount of wins at the mountain, with only one other person having more wins, that person being Peter Brock with nine. So he's two wins away from the all-time record. And in an interview, Roland Dane, the Triple Eight boss, said that he could do it because Lowndes, if you do not know, is going to return as a co-driver in the endurance races in the future. And guess who he's going to partner? And it's probably going to be Jamie Winkup. Um, as we all know, they dominated the mountain when they were partnered together. Back when your co-driver could just be your teammate and not just someone from a development series or a different racing league entirely. So that looks for some dominating races in the future. It really, really does. And I think, given his history with Jamie, it is definitely possible to win Bathurst at least two more times and equal that record with Peter Brock. And what a fairy tale story that would be. That would be amazing if he could do that before he retires from full-time, well, not even full-time racing, before he retires from racing. That would be incredible. But that's something to look forward to next year when he does retire and he does partner up with Jamie Winkup because I can't imagine who else he'll partner up with. But what an, what an ending to a race, really. Really, what an ending. Um, if it wasn't enough having Reynolds cramped leg, it was the fact that Leons was the one that benefited from it. Hats off to him for winning that race. He did the right things all day. All, all day. So let's talk about, now that we're here, the race results. 
Craig Lowndes partnering with Stephen Richards came in first, followed by Scott Pye and Warren Luff in second, up 16 spots from 18th. Good job. Good, good job. Um, I feel very satisfied knowing that my one to watch finished very well in the end. Uh, Scott McLaughlin and Alex Premer in third, rounding out the podium, followed by Chaz Moster and James Moffat in fourth. Shane and Earl Bamber in fifth, Garth Tender and Chris Piffer in sixth, Nick Perkat and Macaulay Jones somehow not moving a spot to finish in seventh. James Golding, sorry, voice is just cracked. Uh, James Golding and Richard Muscat in eighth spot. Good job for them, the first of the rookies. He had a very strong Baffers debut. I was very impressed by him and his driving. Fabian Coulthard and Tony D'Alberto in ninth. They were higher before the end of the race, but seemed to fade a bit at the end. Jamie Winkup and Paul Dumbrell in 10th, a great recovery after being a lap down to finish in 10th spot. Like I said, in the last safety car, they managed to unlap themselves and make it to the end of the grid. And so with the car that they had, they were able to carve up the field and return to the... And return... Okay, start that again. Return to a good, strong finishing position. So that was good to see. A bit of justice for them. Rick Kelly and Gary Jacobson. Jacobson? I never know how to say his name. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry to uh, Gary if you're listening. Uh, finishing in 11th. Mark Winterbottom in 12th. David Reynolds and Luke Yildon in 13th after a heartbreaking finish. A heartbreaking moment to the race. you got to feel bad for the guy. But a 13th place is not terrible considering that they were given a try through penalty and a second pit stop when no one else had to do it. Um, so in hindsight, could have been a lot worse, especially considering that he could have just not have finished the race at all. Uh, Simona in 14th with Alex Rulo. They were really strong, actually. I'm not entirely sure why or how. Um, considering they did so poorly in qualifying. Uh, but they did a really good race. It was actually quite impressive to watch. Um, so good job to them. Jack LeBrock with Jonathan Webb finishing in 15th. A good result from Jack, considering he started in 25th spot. Um, excuse me. An excellent result from him. Um... He had a bit of a wobble. Um, he did move twice under braking at the chase, causing an instance, incident Sorry, um, with, I think, Paul Dumbrell, um, which was a bit leery. Um, but in the end, he did get through, and he learned from his mistakes, so good on him. I hope to see him further up the field um, in the future, because I think he's a strong driver with a bright future ahead of him. Heimgardner and Aaron Russell in 16th. Tim Slade and Ash Walsh in 17th. Tim Blanchard and Dale Wood in 18th. Will Davison with his brother Alex in 19th. Todd Hazelwood and Bryce Fullwood in 20th. Lee Holdsworth and Jason Bright in 21st. The, uh, sorry, not the first of the, la- the, the lapped cars. Um, Richie Stanaway and Steve Owen in 22nd. They had to garage during the race. I'm not quite sure why, but they did finish... Um, Cameron Waters and David Russell in 23rd. They did finish the race as well, but only in 23rd place. Anton Di Pasquale and Will Brown crashing at the end of the race. Unfortunately, ending a very, very strong performance from both of them. And honestly, Will Brown was the stronger driver of the two of them, I thought. He made many passes through the field, and Anton was the one who made both of the mistakes in that car. He locked the brakes coming into the chase early in the race, and he was the one that put it into the wall up at Skyline, ending the race for them. I have really high hopes for Will Brown in the future. I think he's a really strong driver, and he seems like a great guy. So I hope to see him in the sport soon. He seems like a great guy to have around. And not classified, Michael Caruso and Dean Fiore, only completing 69 laps, and James Courtney and Jack Perkins, per- Jack Perkins, out on lap 33 with an engine failure. And that was the Bathurst 1000 for 2018. So, what's next? Well, now we move into the championship because I know it's Bathurst and I know Bathurst is exciting on its own, but there is a championship to worry about. And 
the championship is now still Shane Van Gisbergen in first with Scott McLaughlin in second, as always. Not as always, only been like that for a couple of races. But Scott is only 19 points behind Shane. We are looking to have... We are looking to have a very close final few races. I am super excited. Super excited. It's going to be great. Great. Um, Jamie Winkup in third, 400 points down, followed by Craig Lowndes, who is in fourth. David Reynolds in fifth. Chaz Moster in sixth. Fabian Coulthard in seventh. Rick Kelly in eighth. Scott Pye in ninth. And Tim Slade in tenth. With the rest of the field being Nick Perkat, Garth Tander, Mark Winterbottom, Will Davison, James Courtney, Cameron Waters, Michael Caruso, Jack LeBrock, Andre Heimgartner, Anton Di Pasquale, James Golding, receiving a nice boost after that strong Bathurst performance, Lee Holdsworth, Tim Blanchard, Simona Di Silvestro, Richie Stanaway, Todd Hazelwood rounding out the main drivers. With the rest being co drivers. The team's championship is pretty firmly going to be Red Bull, unless something happens to both their cars, because they are ahead by 579 points from DJR. 2,000 points behind Red Bull in third place is Bottle O Racing and Super Cheap, which is the Tickford cars of Mark Winterbottom and Chaz Mostert, followed by BJR in fourth with Erebus in fifth, Mobile One Boost Mobile Racing, otherwise known as Walkinshaw and Dreddy United in sixth, um, Nissan Racing Cars of Rick Kelly and Andre Heimgarner in 7th, Gary Rogers in 8th, Lowndes in 9th, um, the Nissan Cars of Caruso and Simona in 10th, the Tick for Cars of Waters and Stanaway in 11th, um, Will Davison in 12th, Jack LeBrock in 13th, Lee Holdsworth in 14th, Tim Blanchard in 15th, and Todd Hazelwood in 16th. Next round is the Gold Coast 600, the final round of the endurance races. It takes place in 10 days' time as practice one, which means it's about two weeks away from race day. I have been your host. My name has been Kendall. It has been great to talk to you about a thrilling Bathurst 1000 for 2018. I hope to see you Sorry, I'm not going to see you at all. I hope to talk to you again after the Gold Coast 600. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.